short convex layer on her that when I get around the hairline, I'm sort of starting to make things a bit more short to long. We want to keep all of the edges of this pretty soft and then have it hug the head everywhere else. Um, Kylie Bussing, she is the one who did the color and the inspiration for the haircut that she showed me was actually like a buzz cut. And, but we didn't want to take it all the way down. So I wanted to hug the head like a buzz cut would hug the head, but then have those soft edges. So really just kind of pivoting through the top, made my first guide right down the center. Working out this, she's got a very serious cowlick. Her whole head is basically a cowlick. Yeah, it looks like all the edges of the hairline are quite jumpy, so that makes sense that you want to keep them a little longer and softer. I guess it's either that or scissor over comb. I debated doing yeah. scissor over comb and doing it dry, but I felt like the top was going to be really hard to control. It pushes forward and was going to be hard to pick up. So I'm doing as much as I can in my fingers, and then we'll probably dry it, kind of flat wrap it, and, and do some over comb stuff to refine. So I'm trying to use my wide teeth to keep the tension you know, as light as possible. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. It looks like Aaron's hair was obviously pre-lightened and toned. It's like a beautiful lavender color. I don't know if you know the formulas. I do. Um, this is a very complicated formula here. It's 10V. <laughs> it's 10V and a little bit of clear, actually, from uh, Goldwell Colorants. And I think the initial formula we used had a couple drops of cool violet pure pigments in it. And then we actually just came back and did her base one more time. Her ends, they've been processed a couple times, so they're grabbing a little bit more. Uh, so we did two passes on the base and one pass uh, through the ends. So if you're just joining us, we're here with Jacob Kahn. We are in Amsterdam, uh, and we're here for the Cow Salon Global Experience, which is a two-day event. We're here at Prep. You can see there's a lot of fabulous things going on, and we'll be bringing you tons of content over the next few days. But since Jacob was prepping, we thought, hey, let's get the man cutting some hair live. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, you know, this is obviously a little bit of an early start for our friends in North America because we are on European time. Uh, but let us know where you're watching from. If you have any questions, I'm going to jump on here and look for your questions and your shout outs. So we're just still pivoting through. I've worked out one panel through the top. I'm coming back to the center and pivoting to the other side. You know, I've always sort of had issues with balance. It's always been hard for me. It didn't come very naturally being able to make things balance on both sides. So if I end up doing an entire side, I end up with one side long, one side short. So I usually like to work a bit of a panel, come back and do the other side and work kind of back and forth. Usually I end up a little bit more balanced that way. Working over my fingers because I want a rounded shape. Generally, if I'm working palm to palm like this, I'll get something a little bit more square, a little flatter, but I want this to hug the head. So if I'm working over my fingers, it's easier to just accent that round shape of her head that way. Yeah, so, such a great little uh, tip there. If you can, you can see how the fingers actually bend when you're over the fingers and they're so much flatter when they're inside. So as you work from the center out, are you trying to build any weight towards the round of the head? Is there any over direction? I'm using a traveling guide. So I'm over directing just to my previous section here, really just trying to match the shape of the head. So even if I'm like, picking things up, I'm trying to make sure that my last comb, like let's say I pick up this way, I'm trying to comb towards my guide before I cut. So I'm naturally pulling everything just to the previous to the center there. So we'll get a little bit longer, a little bit more weight in the corner. So tell us a little bit about what you're going to have, uh, what you're going to be doing at the event this weekend at the Cow Salon Global Experience. What's, uh, what's your role? Well, I'm on the education stage doing an artist session with Kylie Bussing where I'm cutting and she's presenting some color. And there's you know a huge kind of onstage presentation, but there's also a show floor where you have a lot of different things going on. You have different brands with different booths. You have different media um, sort of booths as well where you're gonna have live streams. You're gonna have interviews and all sorts of stuff happening. And then you have a center stage there where you have different artists from all over the, all over the world presenting different cuts and colors. So I have two different sessions tomorrow one at 11.30 and I believe one at 2.30. So if you're watching the live stream or if you're gonna be here in person, you can come check us out at either one of those times. Yeah, if you go to uh, Cow Salon Division on Instagram, you can learn all about the YouTube live stream. So even if you're not here in Amsterdam, you'll be able to watch on YouTube. Uh, and I'm proud to say there's a, one other part to the event, it's a competition. Oh, yeah. So it's a global competition with hairdressers from all over the world who've gone through their local national process to come here and present their looks to be judged to be the uh, basically the winner of the year who then goes on to 
work on all sorts of projects with Goldwell, and I'm honored to be one of the judges this year. So oh, my yeah. dance card is full. I'll be hanging out with all these educators and then running over to do some judging. Yeah, I got I got second place in this competition twice, and so I decided to stop entering. I was like, I'm done. First or nothing for me. But now I'm I'm happy to be here presenting. You know, this is probably the shortest look that I'm going to present this weekend. I'm working on some curly hair tomorrow that I'm really excited to show. And we're really one of the things that I've been working into our classes as we tour around is how to cut wavy and curly hair in a way that you can wear it wavy and you can wear it straight. So I'll be showing how to work softly on dry hair. So you're working with the texture of the wave, but then it's very versatile. It can go curly or straight. I think that that's a great concept and I, I, I follow you obviously as hundreds of thousands of people do and I, I think that came from people constantly asking you, can, can you wear it straight? Can you wear yes. it straight? Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely, yeah. People uh, you know, have the nerve to question my methods, <laughs> especially some 12 year olds on TikTok or something were doing that. But I, I really wanted to lean into it really because of that. That's a, that's a great point. People are constantly asking like, can I wear this straight? Can I wear it curly? And I see a lot of people cutting curly hair with silhouette cutting techniques, which I think is great. And I, I love that. I love like geometric shapes cut into curly hair. But then if you're the kind of person that goes back and forth curly and straight, it doesn't really like lend to that ability very much. So uh, Ben White, uh, my coworker, who I travel around with and teach with, we worked out our own way of um, sort of working in soft carved lines, working in small C-shapes. Every little cut is a little mini C-shaped cut. So that even if we're building very particular round shapes, when it blows out, rather than having that sort of tetris edge on it, it's always gonna have a soft edge. So we've finished uh, through the top here. We're gonna cross check. So we worked vertically, or you know, what a profile section. I never know what to say about this section. What would you call that, Gerard? Is this vertical or is this vertical to the well, top? Well, it, it's one of those, uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Yes, yes. It really depends on your perspective. If you're standing on the side, so it's vertical. If you're standing on the back, it's horizontal. So my perspective for my cross check right now is gonna be horizontal. We were I, vertical and we're coming back horizontal now. I can agree with that. And I think, you know, little things like that are what keeps our craft so interesting. Uh, for those of us who've been doing it for years, it's, there, there's no new uh, arguments there. Yeah, I've heard that same argument for 32 years, and it, you know, at, at a certain point, and then you get mature enough that you just kind of go, "Well, I'll call it whatever, whatever you want you me to call it. As long as you can understand it, I'll call it whatever you want. I can be whatever you want me to be, yeah. baby. So yeah, this is looking pretty good. A little bit of cleanup here. If I was to see anything that looked really off, maybe that it was a, a real bit longer rather than a simple little check, I'd go back and cut it the original way. I don't want to change the shape that I put in. So, but we're looking pretty good. So let's introduce our viewers all over the world to our model. This is Erin, Erin, correct? Yeah. This is Erin, Erin, are you from here in Amsterdam or? I live in Manchester in the UK. Ah, okay, so you're here just for the show. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Have you done this type of event before? Yeah, this is my fifth one. With Goldwell or yeah. with different companies? Wow. This Goldwell show, my right fifth on. one. So then yeah. you're telling all the other girls yeah. what, what to expect and yeah. how it's <laughs> like, going to go? This is when lunches. You're the, the mother, dan mother hen? Yeah, yeah, I've got to get all the, the You say hunters. when lunches? You yeah, tell them when I lunch? immediately am like, what, we've got to be ready for lunch as soon as this is. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. like, if we get our fitting out the way today, we can definitely we don't want anybody faint. We don't want anyone fainting, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm sure you've seen that before. Oh yeah, definitely. Since, uh, <laughs> well, again, with, you know, for these events without models like Erin, we couldn't do it. You know, so it all starts with the model. So for you, Jacob, when you met Erin, um, how did you read her hair, analyze her hair? It was obviously already short, but a lot goes into understanding. You know, how you're going to execute. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that I noticed when I saw her in person, we luckily enough to see her in a picture beforehand. We can kind of decide and plan what we want to do before we actually got. Um, here to Amsterdam. When I saw her in person, I could really see that as her hair dried, I'm assuming it was an air dry at the time, all the corners pushed back, everything lifted up, every little bit lifted up. So I actually consulted with uh, Sana Brado over there, if you guys know who she is. Oh, we'll, we'll be live with Sana tomorrow for her international fans. <laughs> yeah, Sana's absolutely amazing. So I, I talked with her a little bit to decide about how I wanted to approach it. Did I want to cut it wet or did I want to cut things dry? And if I was um, cutting things dry in the beginning, I, I thought maybe I would do that. But working dry, I was afraid that I wasn't gonna be able to control the hair on the top very much because it was really hard to pick up. It pushes forward really, yeah. really dramatically. So having the hair wet just that helps me control that. The hair also kind of swells. And so even sometimes when it's dry, it's hard to get it in the comb. 
Exactly. It was it was difficult to pick up, difficult to control with my fingers when it was dry. So I ended up deciding to do it wet for that reason. So now I've worked through the top. I've got my guide section here through the top. So I've pivoted through. I'm starting now in the corner and just working diagonally forward. And I see the movement of her hair. It really wants to, to move forward like that besides this last little section here. So I'm just trying to work with how the natural movement of her hair is. Still just following the shape of the head as we go. Think about this being a bit of a layer. And on the side, I always feel like my it's a little easier body position to work this way than it is for me to work like this, still over my fingers. So I'm switching to palm to palm now, working slightly diagonally forward. Checking my guide there at the top where I've got that uh, short bit and then just connecting. Still thinking about it being layered. I want this to get a little longer towards the front hairline so we're keeping that kind of fringy and soft feeling there in the front hairline. So are you angling longer to the hairline or is your cutting line kind of just square and letting it just build length as the head curves away? I'm basically square, not wanting to angle my fingers out too much because I don't want it to get you know too heavy through here. I just want to have that natural kind of softness that um, you know, working with the head shape will give you. So tell us a little bit about um, what's happening in your salon. Now I know that uh, you're also a salon. Salon manager, Jessica, and our floor manager, Kristen, they handle basically everything for me when I'm not there. It took me a long time to get comfortable delegating out the roles. I was very, you know, micromanagey, afraid of, of being away, afraid of letting someone else do things. So I was, you know, burning the candle at both ends. I'd be traveling, taking clients Tuesday through, Tuesday through Saturday for a long time. Then I would fly out Saturday night, class on Sunday and Monday, and then we'd come back and have uh, clients again on Tuesday. So now I've let myself come out of the salon a little bit, taking clients Wednesday through uh, Friday, and I have my team there kind of holding down the court. We've also added in a rental model as well. So we have commission people and we have renters. We just opened a brand new space. We went from 2,500 square feet to um, 4,500 square feet. In the same building, we just moved upstairs. There was like a software company that was upstairs above us that had this incredible, gorgeous space in a historic building in my town. And it was just such a waste of a stunning space. So as soon as they moved out, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get in there and, and take that space over. A big thing's happening for you. And as I always say, you know, Salon ownership is the most difficult job in this industry. Oh, it's like, this so hard. feels like vacation to you right now. Oh, for sure. I mean, this is th these are the moments that I really love. Of course, I love the mentorship in the salon. I love working with clients still. But when I'm just getting to kind of casually work on models and do creative work, it's definitely... And just talk about hair with a bunch of other hair nerds. Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I'm doing the same thing on the other side now. I've got my guide here from the corner. That's where I stopped doing those pivoting sections through the top. I'm just gonna take these diagonal forward sections now. Uh, shout out to Maddie Krupa, who's agreeing with you that cutting this type of hair needs to be cut wet first, then checked and uh, dry refined, which is sounds like that's your game plan. Absolutely. I definitely know I'm gonna have a bit of dry refinement. Not only is her hair very fine, which is gonna show every little line in her hair as I cut, but it's very blonde too. So any little like miss of the guide or too much over direction is you're going to see that weight so i definitely plan on going over it again on dry hair with scissor over comb maybe even dusting over it with a texturizing scissor i saw you do something like this at um a club intrigue on someone that actually works at my salon now it was was a model of yours named chelsea back in the day i, I was drunk that night you are aren't you always though? yes, yes. <laughs> and it was very similar color and that you know was was a long time ago one of my reasons i started going over these cuts with the texturizing scissor not to blow smoke too hard just because you said that's something that you always do on these these cuts on dry hair so. i'm very honored that uh international social media sensation and hairdressing <laughs> uh is giving me a shout out here very very honored but yeah in all honesty jacob is uh this is what i love you know, Jacob's got a solid background, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit because sure. it involves Wayne Lee. Yeah. And I don't know if you heard about Wayne. He's had some health issues. I didn't know he, yeah, was he had a heart attack. Oh my gosh, when? Yeah, recently. So anyway, I just not, sent him a pair of scissors like yeah. a few weeks ago. Not to get morose, but uh, when uh, Jacob was a young hairdresser, he trained. Uh, I'll let you tell the story. Yeah. I love this story. Uh, so, Wayne Lee was an educator at Bedell Sassoon and he was opening up an academy with Lucy Dowdy in Atlanta randomly. They were taking clients at a place called AT Tramp in Beverly yeah. Hills, I guess, together. And they were opening an advanced academy called The Mastery. And I was lucky enough to get the job being the assistant cutting educator there. 
and I trained under him for about a year and a half while they were doing that, and it was such an incredible experience. I mean, I've been doing hair for probably six years or something at the time, and basically got busted down to an assistant, and I mean, that's when I really felt like I was able to refine my skills cutting, was because I had Wayne be super honest with me yeah. about how my haircuts were. He would say, um, come on, Jacob, what, yeah. what is this? He's what are like, you doing over here? Uh, next time, make this haircut look good. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Things like that. And that is, that's a yeah. great, it's not yeah. a bad, terrible Wayne, yeah, Wayne yeah. impression there. Yeah. Well, shout out to Wayne. I hope that he's doing better. I know, uh, you know, again, for those of you that know him from the L.A. Sassoon days, uh, you know, he's one of the unsung heroes because he didn't have the loudest voice, but he was a super talented guy, and great educator. So shout out to Wayne Lee. Hope you're feeling better out there. I was All always... Right, you're moving into the back. Let's yes, just hear yes. about that, and then we'll get back to our... So I started my sections here on the side and worked diagonally forward. Now I'm coming to the back switching, working diagonally back. Really just trying to work with the shape of the head and work with the natural movement of the hair. Following the shape of the head until I get down to the nape there and leaving that nape out because we want to have that kind of um, soft, fringy, like mullety feeling. Still just working palm to palm as I go. So I noticed you work very precisely, but it's, uh, it's not overly precise. It feels like you're really working to get this shape in without kind of overly stressing and trying to clip the hair and, you know, oh, yeah. it 500 times. Like, I've always believed that the basic shape, you know, it, it's a rough shape. You don't want to make mistakes, but if I find sometimes people spend too much time on the basic shape and then they run out of gas for the really important parts. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I really, I like to be pretty minimalist while I'm cutting. I don't work with a lot of clips. I don't work with a whole lot of pre-sectioning whenever I'm able to do that. Um, so you're right, I'm just sort of like, letting the, the head be the clip. I'm pushing the sections out of the way, and I know that I'm gonna have to do some refinement later, so I'm getting that basic shape in and anticipating that I'm gonna have to go back and, and refine lines and soften things. You know, there's this kind of routine that I think well-trained hairdressers, especially those who have a Sassoon background with short hair, and you're gonna do it right now. Like, when you, when you take the section and then you put your thumb in there and then you put your comb in there, like, just break this down, because I know a lot of people struggle with being clean on short hair and organizing and organizing off the growth. So walk us through the whole process here. Well, for each section, basically what I'm doing, I'm gonna take See that thumb, a simple thumb, section. Yeah. And that, that is something in class that yeah. it's hard to teach people yeah. how to control a section. Literally, I'm combing the hair, leaving my thumb to kind of control that and then combing things out of the way. Then I'm just combing right into my previous section to pick it up. Rather than trying to sub out what I've yeah. already cut, I'm just gonna pick up what will naturally get picked up as my guide, one little check, and then I'm working through. I don't wanna waste too much time you know, you see a lot of this happening with people, and maybe that can be part of somebody's process. Maybe it helps them be more accurate or helps them think, but for me, I just am trying not to waste too much time. I'm just trying to get that shape in, you know? Yeah, we used to call it the economy of motion. So like getting Ooh. the result that you need with the right movements, and it's like comb, thumb, comb, fingers. Yeah, yeah, That's I like it. that. The economy of motion. Have you trademarked that? Uh, of course, of course. Yeah. No, okay, <laughs> so, that's mine now. I, I, it's an NFT. If you want to, invest. oh, it is. And you want to invest in it? It's it's my new NFT. You're like I've got uh, the, I've got an ape, and I've got the economy of motion. <laughs> yeah. That's my portfolio now. Yeah. All right, so I've worked across one side of the back. I'm going to come to the other side now and work through. And we're going to re-wet this down a teeny bit. So how do you know it's time to re-wet? Well, I just see that uh, things are starting to naturally dry and it's a little bit more difficult for me to control that section as it's, it's to, like, getting dry. out of the comb. Yeah. And I want to make sure that I have even tension this whole haircut. And if I'm working on a bit of it while it's half dry and a bit of it while it's wet, then I might end up with a side that's jumpier, a side that's a little bit more controlled. Because whenever it's a little drier, I've got to use more tension. And whenever I'm pulling on the hair that, that much, it starts to spring out and jump back. That's actually a big thing that Wayne taught me. Uh, I learned that working on really like short pixie cuts on Asian texture, like Japanese texture, where it wants to jump out a lot. He, I would cut one side of a haircut, it was super jumpy. He taught me about tension, cut the other side, and it laid down really nicely. And that was this big light bulb moment for me, really. So just taking those diagonal back sections, we're gonna follow the shape of the head, working off our guide that we have from up here, pivoting through. You can really see like what kind of motion we're getting. And look, look at this. That looks really quite beautiful on the camera. Oh, well, thank it, you. It reminds me of my, our good friend Tom Connell did a lot of collections on short hair. It was all about combing uh, beautiful stuff. The did, swirl. Did you do that one? That's my Okay. <laughs> That's well, we're we're going to be seeing Tom that's next you? week. That's my swirly yeah. head. Oh, amazing. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's incredible. See how, see how good my eye is? What a small see world. That? You spotted the... Yeah. The, you can see her cowlick. Yeah. Yeah. It's a historical cowlick that we're historical. working on right now. 
We'll see if I can work on it as good as Tom. So yeah, working on my guides here. You can see my shorter bits. Working right on my fingers. And as I come down here, it starts to get difficult for me to bend my wrist this way. So, and I know this is sort of, um, maybe some people aren't into it, maybe they are, but I like to work with a flat position sometimes where I'll work with oh, my fingers like this. Oh, man, you turned your hand around. Yeah. <laughs> There's definitely some it's argument about that. Those, another one of those old, long-standing things in hairdressing, you know, as horizontal as a vertical. Oh, can I turn my wrist this way? Hey, it's scissors, scissors shears. shears. Yeah, yeah. Hey, if you can get in there and cut the line, it, you know, it doesn't matter to me if you want to hang from the ceiling upside down, you know? Yeah, I would say you can chew it off for all I care, yeah. as long as it looks good when it's done. And, you know, I used to be very idealistic about a razor, even. Like, I oh. didn't want to use a razor. And then I started using... Um, a plie razor. I think my first class was was from you and Nick, actually. Oh, so apparently you've learned a lot from me. That's true. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to just like it, it just happens to be true. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to give you too much credit, but um, but yeah. And then I was idealistic in another way about the razor. I didn't want to use a feather with a guard. And then I watched a uh, Sebastian collection oh, on Hairbrain. Yes, I watched yeah. Shay come with it, and I was Change like, okay, yeah. there is a whole uh, art to using this tool. That's com it's different from using the plie. Plie, so I started yeah. working with that tool now too, yeah. and I'm just trying to be as versatile as possible. And you know, if, if that was something I could go back and tell myself when I was a young hairdresser, yeah. uh, not that I'm not that old now, but um, but it would be to not stress so much about the ideals. There isn't one way to do these things. There's a there's a bunch of different ways, and this is just a way to do it. And you know, but, so the path that you're talking about, I sometimes find to be the best best path. I, so I would say to you, I, I'm glad that you started off a little bit idealistic. Okay. Mm. But then kept an open, because you have to focus on something to get good at it first. And if you try to be so open-minded, you're all over the place. So like, but then once you get good at it, to realize that it's not right or wrong, it's just a way. Oh, and there are a lot, a lot more ways, you know? So I think you went down the right path. And I think, you know, at least with my experience at Sassoon and people like Wayne Lee, I think they understood that. It's like, this is, this is black, this is white. Once you get that down, then you go into the world of gray. Yeah, I, th I love to hear that. I'm glad. I'm happy I did the right thing, unbeknownst to me that it was working out the right way. I, I, it's funny because my my little brother is actually my apprentice right now. Like my, I've had a bunch of different assistants and apprentices. My brother, he was a, a public school teacher, and now he's decided that he wants to do hair. Uh, so I told him, you know, there's a million ways to do things, but for a while, I want you to try and do it just like me. Yeah. Just work it out my way. Look what I'm doing, and then eventually you can you can find your own way to do it. Yeah, I mean, because you know it, it's a craft, and there has to be a baseline, I think, in a craft. And for some people, not all, it does become an art. And those are the people who I think embrace a lot of different things. For some people, it stays a craft forever, and they do things a certain way forever. And it, that's just the beauty of our of our industry. Yeah, it's, it's such a versatile thing. Anybody, you know, you can find your own way, find the way that makes you happy to do it. You know, like Ben and I, we create all of our curriculums together. We travel and teach together. We've had a lot of the same doing hair next to each other every day, like all the time. So I always thought that was kind of a cool thing, that even if you're exposed to exactly the same content and education, you can end up doing things a little bit differently than each other. So in addition to uh, owning a salon, doing all this amazing stuff on social media, doing hair shows with Goldwell. You've also got a podcast. I do. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the podcast. Okay. <laughs> the podcast uh, is called... You know, I our, think I got in a lot of trouble. Our, uh, our goal with the podcast at first was really to talk about all the things that you're not supposed to talk about in the salon. You know? I think I, I managed to do that yes. fairly well. Yeah. We tried, I might have burned a few bridges. We try to do... I, mean, I don't think that you did. If I, okay. no, I think you're, no, you're talking about. It. I mentioned it to them later, and they're totally. They were like, "No, no, we love him." So, <laughs> so it's totally fine. Um, I'm just taking off some of these calyx underneath, just to get back to the haircut for a moment. But I have this thought about calyx. You know, when in doubt, you just cut them out. And if there's just a little bit of hair underneath here, I'm gonna lift up this fringy stuff that we want to keep, and then I'm just clippering this off. I've got this um, awesome new babalus, black and, and gold, killing it. So, I mean, the idea there is that if you get underneath and you have enough length to cover it, you can kind of minimize the strength of the hairline. Yeah, I can help this lay down a bit. And I also sometimes like that it takes some of the weight out from underneath and makes the hairline a little more translucent. It makes it a little bit softer. Even though when I dry it, I'm still going to go back possibly with a feather 
and kind of like detail that hairline out a bit. That's another thing yeah. that I, I never did before was use a razor on dry hair. And now I, I'll totally use a razor on dry hair. Um, let's do one other thing that you shouldn't do with the razor, maybe. So. Well, that's a fancy razor you have. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, um, of course, we're the only ones who have ever designed a razor like this, right? No. This is our, like, basically it's, it's the plie shape. We tweaked it a teeny bit. I like everything to be rose gold, so we've got a little hint of rose gold handle and a, and a white, or rose gold sheath with the right handle. And then what I'm going to do with it, to clean up around the ears here, to show, I think it's cool to show this. I learned this from Ben. You can actually put this blade on your skin with no guard if you have the right amount of control and we can just like yeah. you know, you take know that the little bit. You know that is? Do you know Lee Clapson? No, I don't. Who's that? Right. I gotta well, check him out. Follow Lee Clapson. He's a brilliant razor cutter who's really made his own method of razor cutting. He's English, but he's based in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. Um, a head area is the name of his salon. He's been- Oh, I've, 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 uh, I've heard of it actually. Yeah, you should see him razor cut for even another perspective. Yeah, I, I first was real nervous about this. And you, yeah. Well, I don't even know what the legality of it is in the U.S., you know? Oh, it's, it's highly illegal. Yeah, it's highly we've, illegal? We've called the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time with that in class, too. I'm, like, teaching it in class, like, showing, oh, you guys can use this in every single class. They're like, well, I, I don't think we can. We're not allowed to use it because I don't have a barber license. And from my understanding, and I could be totally wrong about this, feel free to correct me, is that the language, usually with state board, is that... You can't use it on the skin, but you can use it on the hair. And that's sort of how I'm getting away with the idea of using it, is that we're never actually touching this other people's so, skin with it besides our own. So here's another one of those ongoing things that you do this for 30 years, you'll hear. You know what I always used to say? Call your state board and see what they tell yeah, you. Yeah. And absolutely no one has ever called their state board to ask them. So We're going to use a little bit of flat marble. And this, a lot of time I'll use this for more coarse texture, but because her hair has been lightened so much and it's very jumpy, it's just gonna give me some control to help this hair lay down. So. I wanna give a shout out to our Atlanta friend, Hannah Ruth Evans. We love Hannah. She's been watching and joining in, sending a lot of support. Maddie Corpra, still uh, a lot of support, a lot of great comments from Finland. Oh, wow. Yep. Hannah's one of the best. I love the Atlanta hair scene, really. It's like. I don't know if it's like this everywhere, but so many it's different not. salons are connected and so many hairdressers are kind of cool with each other I, and collaborating. I can give you my, my, so I worked in Atlanta and I always say the two best hair cities in America are Atlanta and Minneapolis. And it usually starts from one or two people. Atlanta, for me, was a lot to do with Scott Cole. Scott Cole, for sure. My, Cole. my first cutting teacher ever, Scott yeah. Cole, actually. But, you know, he, he came and opened a salon. After, there, was, there was a Sassoon that it didn't, um, it didn't last, and he stayed yeah. and opened his own salon in both Van and DJ. And I worked of... right next to that Sassoon in yeah. Lenox Mall yeah. at a salon called Das. Yeah. Da, uh, well, Jim, there you go. Now it's Candy also, Shaw's also uncle. the Shaws. Yeah, Candy yeah. Shaw's uncle Don. Yeah. I was uh, that was the first salon I ever worked in. Was I worked for yeah. Don? So you can trace this whole culture in Atlanta back to Scott Cole, also the Shaw family. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. there's others as well. Yeah, the Shaws, but... you got uh, Siggers. Remember yeah, S yeah, yeah. Siggers. Yeah. Yes. I always want to say it that way. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it just sort of naturally wants to come yeah. out like that. All right, so we're going to blow dry our hair. I'm not even going to use a brush, most likely. Right now, I'm just going to use my fingers and try to just let this cowlick do its thing, and then we'll come back and do some refinement. Yeah. Just yeah, using it's, my hand. Yeah. It's something that I've always, as I said, I mentioned, any, any brand I've ever worked with, I'm like, if you can't get popular in Atlanta, you're going to have a hard time with hairdressers in the United States because it's like the test lab. And it's some of the most passionate hairdressers. And I can go on and on. I, you know, I think Van Council is the best salon owner in the world. Oh, yeah. Hopefully you learn from Van I mean, in your business. Of all of these like big and corporate style salons where they have, you know, Van's got hundreds of hairdressers, yeah. so many different locations. He's one of the only ones to like, really stick around. Oh, yeah. I mean, so many people that had like 10 salons now have one salon and yeah. Van's still growing. I actually got to connect with him in person. You know, we've been on the edges of each other's world for so oh. long, but Recently, we did a charity. You should have him on the show. podcast. Oh, I would love to. Yeah. We, we have to talk with you. Because, yeah. you know, as as you know, if you are a guest on the podcast, expect us to yeah. do a deep dive into your life oh, yeah. so that we can bring up some things that you haven't thought about oh. in a very long time. Man's not shy. Oh, and you, can, you yeah. definitely know he's not shy with those, yeah. those tight spandex biker pants yeah, that he's wearing around. Yeah, baby. You can see, you know, even though her hair is very color, jumpy. The color is just stunning. Oh, yeah, that's uh, the color? Is Kylie she Bussing. Is she here? Wherever she is. Kylie. Yes. This is this is who did the color. My um, partner in crime here today. 
because I do color and cut. I do everything. I do both, but I, I really prefer to cut, so I love when I can work with the strong colors. So Kylie Bussing, uh, color is gorgeous. People are just saying how beautiful it is. Um, tell us a little bit about it. And uh, wh wh where are you from? What city? I'm from Boston, and essentially we're going to create a really cool gradient on stage. Oh, okay. So, I just so this is nice... just the base. Oh, this is just the base, yeah. But wait, there's more. There's yeah. more. So I just needed a nice clean base. So we just went in with some Silk Lift Strong 6%, uh, and we toned her with a bit of clear and 10 deep color on Six percent too. Yes. Like, people are so <laughs> people Hello. are so quick to jump in with with high volumes and everything. So you're a big proponent of like work low and slow. She's low like a natural slow. level eight, right? Yeah, so she's we, a unicorn. Right. So it was the perfect base, and that's how we got that nice clean canvas. Fantastic, fantastic. And then give us a little bit of an idea of what you're going to do on stage with your gradient. Yeah, so I wanted to go with something a little bit more rebellious, but still wearable, a little bit of like a punk influence. So we're going to create a gradient with three different shades. We'll be mixing up some Illumin Play. Um, I still haven't really decided what color family I want to go with, but it's going to be really fun, really inspiring, and just, like I said, a little bit rebellious. It's going awesome. to be a 6N. Yeah, 6N. 6N. And guys, this is all going to be broadcast on YouTube. So you want to, first thing you can do is go to Cow Salon Division on Instagram, Cow Salon, K-A-O Salon Division or Goldwell or KMS, get all the information about the times and in your locality, and then you'll be able to watch on YouTube and see all these great artists work their magic. All right, thank you, Kylie. Thank you. All right, so it looks like you've jumped into some refining now. Yeah, I'm just kind of dusting over the whole thing with um, my 14 tooth. I really right, let's talk about let's talk about the, the teeth choice. Yeah, so I like a, a 14 tooth. It's kind of scary, right? Because there's all this big negative space on the scissor, and a lot of people will shy away from it for that reason. But it's really nice because it really doesn't take out all that much. It's kind of like a, a slow, mellow texturizing scissor. I got to work over it a few more times, but I like that because you know I'd rather have to come back more than close a few times and go, oh, wish I, I wish I hadn't taken out so much. So when I first left Sassoon and I first ever picked up any texturizing scissors, I had a friend named David Bangham, and he, he, the way he explained it to me, it's like, uh, think of uh, like a person's teeth. If someone has a lot of teeth they and they shoot. bite into steak, they just rip right through it. <laughs> but if they have a lot of spaces and gaps, they're gonna take a less less steak out. I, so every time I see the scissors, <laughs> I think about steak. They gotta chew. They gotta chew a they gotta lot chew more. A lot. Yeah. This, is, they, this is steak. You gotta yeah. chew it up a yeah. lot more. This is a rare steak right yeah. here. Or or if there are vegetarian vegan friends, mushroom. <laughs> yeah, this is a portobello burger. Yeah. So like you can see where I let things get a bit longer around the edge right there. So when I do this, I don't want to pick it up right away there and cut all that off. I'm actually going to lift that up a teeny bit more and start a, a bit behind that so that I'm leaving more of that length around the front, but still letting it soften out a teeny bit from this. And I, I love to see that after we've worked through, even just cutting blunt lines. We haven't done any texturize or anything here through the top and we get this like kind of really kind of cool, soft feeling. You don't have to do much if you're you know thinking about your technique from the very beginning. Right now, there's so much very soft, uh, wild cutting that's very popular on social media. And you know, I also do, I do a lot of it myself because of the things that are popular, the shapes that are popular right now. And texturizing is really fun, but I always find that things hold up a little better if I have a stronger technique to start and then go back and break it down. So if you're just joining us, we're here in Amsterdam. We literally just arrived not too long ago, but we rushed here to spend some time with Jacob Kahn and his model, Aaron. Uh, he's preparing for uh, some education he'll be doing over the next few days. It will also be a competition here, um, and it'll all be live streamed on, on YouTube. Um, so you'll be able to find that information at the Cow Salon Division, or the Goldwell Instagram, or the KMS Instagram. I wanted to ask you, who were you excited to learn from, to see, to engage with this weekend? I mean, besides me. <laughs> well, um, you know, I think this is such a great event because it brings hairdressers together from all over the world. So there's so many great uh, Goldwell and Cow artists that I always love to watch. Really a big one, again, is, is Sauna. You know, you, uh, I think you probably feel the same way. You've taken a lot of classes, you've seen a lot of people do hair, and you don't always leave a class feeling like, oh, I learned something new. I saw something that I haven't seen before, and I think that Sauna is one of the people that, when I watch her, I usually leave 
that lesson feeling like I got something new. I feel like a better hairdresser every time I, I see her work, so. No doubt we're huge fans of Sana. Come over here right now, quick, quick one. Here she is, she's. <laughs> I was just gonna take a video. She's gonna be live, video, live with us tomorrow. So for those of you that are friends of Sana Brano, she'll be with us tomorrow doing a haircut, same thing. Welcome to Amsterdam, are you having fun already? I am having a wonderful time. And if anybody watched my stories yesterday, I was all over the city and just had a great time. It's right beautiful, on. loved right it. On. Did you go into any coffee shops? But I had coffee. Ah, come on. <laughs> she's, on she's on mushrooms right now. <laughs> <laughs> what do they call it? Microdosing. <laughs> Everyone Microdosing. here. I yeah, know, it's I part of the microdosing. event. Everyone's microdosing. <laughs> All right, well, we'll have tomorrow. We're shooting for, I think, 1 p.m. EU time. Right? Is that correct? 1 p.m. here. Yes. 1 p.m. here. Yes. So I don't know what time Whatever that is anywhere else in the world. You're going to be up the early. The less I think about it, the better. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, you have to make sure you get up early if you're in the U.S. to see Sana tomorrow. I'll be sure to take my dose early so that I'm ready. Like, yeah, so you're pe she's going to be peaking by <laughs> 1 o'clock. So I, I had a little bit more to take off at the bottom, so I switched away from my texturizers back to uh, five and a half inch, which is kind of my go-to size. I have been playing around a little bit with bigger scissors, but if I am just like automatic when I'm grabbing a scissor, I just reach for a five and a half right away. I think it's just because I started off with a, a smaller scissor, so it just feels more natural to me. But I have played with a seven a little bit now. <laughs> Sometimes it feels uh, unnecessary, but I do think it can be fun. Some deep point cutting. You know, it's another one of those things that, again, there's a lot of, uh, I, I want to say myths about, like people say, measure the sides of your hand from your palm to your fingertips. Oh my goodness. But it's just all personal choice. I've seen people with very small hands, like big scissors, people with big hands like small scissors. It's all personal choice. I do find that when I when I get really comfortable with one thing, I do try to use something else just to make myself aware of my hands. Yeah, I think it's also fun just to not get too stagnant, you know? When I, I that happens to me with um, the shapes and stuff that I'm doing as well. If I start to feel a little bored, a little stagnant, normally what I end up doing is I go back to basics and I do very simple shapes, and then I try something new. As soon as it starts to feel a little bit um, too boring, or if I feel like I've done the same thing too many times, I definitely switch it up, especially with um, with my clients. If I feel like, you know, lately I feel like I've just done a, a curtain a curtain bang on 95% of clients that come in, so I've just start pushing them in a different direction. Right away I'm like, well, I guess we're gonna leave it longer. We're not gonna do a curtain bang anymore. And I've always, I think that's hilarious too that it's that things are now named after household items and animals instead of like the people who made them famous originally. Well, it's another one of those things where you know people say, "Oh, this is the butterfly cut," and then five hundred people say, "We used to call it this, or we used yeah, to call yeah. it that." You know the old joke? It's the only hairdressing joke I know. How many hairdressers does it take to change a light bulb? How many? A hundred. Uh, Ninety-nine to do it, and one to say, "I've done that already." <laughs> or I thought it was the other way around. I might have got the math wrong. Yeah, it's, hey, come on, one, I'm one to do it, 99 to tell you you're doing it wrong. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's there the you way go. it feels That's to me. You're, you're the comedian. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave the jokes to you. All right, so we're going to do a little deep point cutting through this um, hairline now just to break things up and start to define the shape. So we're going to, I'm just looking for where it, like right here, it feels pretty soft already. Here it feels a little bit heavy. I'm going to go in and we're going to really go in pretty deep and break that up, move a little bit come here to the center. I'm, notice I'm holding her head at the top. You know, not really for any other reason besides I want to make sure that she doesn't move. Anytime I'm putting my steel to skin there, I usually put my other hand on their head to keep them still, to keep them safe and to make sure that my lines are going to be consistent and clean. But I want this to be kind of soft and undone. I think it could also be cool to kind of cut this out in kind of a graphic way. But for her, we want all the strength and everything through the interior and all the edges to be really soft. Just working in a vertical point cut, kind of a parallel point cut to the hair. We could come in at a 45 degree angle, but that's gonna make things a little chunkier, a little bolder, which chunky I think has been a bit of a bad word in hairdressing, but it is definitely coming back. I noticed chunky textures, uh, sort of bolder block colors, chunky layers, things like that coming back in. We just need to find a new word for it so our, our clients get comfortable with it, but I definitely see it getting more popular again. So uh, would you say that your approach here was to go kind of parallel with the hair growth, so you just kind of created separation but not chunkiness? Exactly, I'm working like a, a deep parallel point cut, following the same movement of the hair as I go to diffuse the line but not change the line Sh and get softness. About, you know, like, 
people have a challenge with this. People can have a challenge with this because they bury their hand in the scissor. Like where so, they're, yeah, yeah. When I'm holding my scissor, it never goes in past this knuckle on this finger. And then if I'm you know, doing over comb, by the time I've opened the scissor, my thumb is actually out of the, of the hole <laughs> by the time it comes out. And then when I'm working those flat positions, I'm basically taking my pinky, pulling the scissor flat like that, and then I bend my thumb at a right angle and just rest it on top of the blade. And that allows me to kind of get this 360 degree angle. So I always say, you wanna be able to do more with your tools so that you can have less of them because they're very expensive, you know, and a lot of tools that are coming out, you don't really need them and you don't want it to end up being a crutch, you know? I, I've ha One thing I haven't really played with all that much is a swivel. Um, I I've and, recently tried. I'm considering yeah. it. And so people I, kept correcting me and saying, you're not using it properly. You're not using it properly. Yeah, yeah, to bring yeah. it to swivel, <laughs> for God's sake. It's got I did a few videos. Like I, I wanted to launch one for Hairbrained, so I got a company to send me a bunch of them and I tried them and I was enjoying it, but people kept telling me, you're not using it right. You're not using it right. Oh my gosh. What, what, what could be the way that you're using it wrong? Is, like, is, I, it, is it cutting the hair? You probably you're... lock the swivel. I think that the whole... <laughs> yeah, like, he just doesn't use the swivel? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Some of the, the idea was that you really need to keep your elbow down. And, you know, I was still moving my elbow because I've been moving just my used elbows to doing that. for 32 years cutting hair. But it was like, no, keep your elbow down, keep your elbow down. And I just... And I, I put them away and cried and never did it again. Her little cowlick here on the top, because it does get a little jumpy, I'm deciding just to take it down even a little bit more. And... You know, just doing that over comb, not doing it in my fingers, just for whatever does jump up. I don't want it to jump up too high and we can have it sort of, you know, be part of the style, especially if we style with a little texture, a little movement. And now I'm just going across the top in the same way that I uh, cross-checked originally and just chipping into it a teeny bit. It doesn't really need a whole lot. I feel like it is blending pretty well, but because her hair is so straight and so blonde, I want to make sure that no matter what she does with it, it's always going to kind of blend out and not have any weird blunt uh, sharp lines in it. So you know, we always see a lot of questions about uh, like jumpy crowns, mm -hmm. especially with men's cutting and stuff. And I remember one thing that I learned pretty early on um, was either keep it long enough that it lays down or cut it short enough that it doesn't matter. It's everything in between that's the problem. That's true. I think that's true. And I also think that the tension is a big part of it and the sectioning. Like whenever I see that someone's got a serious whirl pattern, you know, I, I decided to kind of pivot off of her actual pattern when I did my initial uh, shape. And I usually feel like that helps it lay down. If I kind of pick it up and force it out of its natural position and cut it, it's gonna jump out and, and stand up in a way crazier way. Look up a little bit for me and close your eyes. Get into the front, you know, simple little tip I think is great is to tell your clients to close their eyes when you're working around the front. I know it seems a little first thought, like of course, oh yeah, close your eyes, but oftentimes we don't. Then we have clients uh, get hair all in their eyes and you end up with a Yelp review of like, a one-star review that says your haircut looked great, but he got hair in my eyes. I'm not well, talking from experience. It is about the experience and the service, right? I mean, we can never forget that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, that's something that we're really trying to upgrade all the time, is the experience in the salon and for our clients. That's one reason that we decided to get the bigger space. We've actually, uh, we have a full bar in the salon now for clients that want that. And as my haircuts have gotten more expensive, I'm trying to, you know, really make a meal out of them every time that I do it. I want even the simplest service, like a haircut, to be a full-on experience, you know? And a lot, I think a lot of time it can get left to the wayside. These days, color is so popular, extensions are so popular, people will just cut the bottom and curl it, and that's the haircut. But I really want it to be an experience for every client that comes in. So any tips, now I, I, we haven't spoken about it much, but you've done phenomenally well on social media. Mm -hmm. Um, and but kind of done it your own way, meaning I, you know you didn't just follow like what people were doing hair wise to get popular. You kind of were like, this is the way I believe in. This is what I do. Um, so any advice anyone wants to follow that path? Yeah, I think you know besides all the regular social media advice, like oh you got to do videos, you got to make reels, and all of that stuff. There's like some generic advice that I think is great, and it's it's authenticity. It's like a very influencer type of a word, authenticity. But people. Don't just fake it. Don't just say like, we want this to be authentic. But really, I think a big part of why we got popular is that uh, everything that you see online, the way that I'm talking and behaving is exactly the way that I talk and behave in real life. And we started doing that early. We started adding in the voiceover, adding in um, the video early so that we're not only just showing hair that we did, but showing ourselves and showing our personality. So 
Whatever it is that makes you happy, that makes you tick, that makes you excited about hair, that's what you should be putting out there. Don't try to conform to, you know, especially nowadays, even everything is exactly the same on there. You know, even the sounds, the trending sounds, like right. that's a thing that I think it can be kind of cool, but I'm kind of getting over it a little bit, is that all of the background sounds are exactly the same. And you'll notice that you never see me mouthing any words on social media and you never see me using these trending sounds. You might see me using like nostalgic emo music from the past. And it's oh, actually and been, why is that? Well, I mean, this is this is this is who I am. I'm like <laughs> just an adult, hardcore kid, uh, an emo kid that grew up into a hairdresser, and it's been great for me. We actually got to cover an entire hardcore emo music festival last weekend on social media because we were putting that out there, and not because it was a trending sound, just because it was what we were doing while we were trending. So, you know, find your your thing and, and keep at it. Look Good advice, and I, I second that emotion right here because uh, you know I think. Be yourself, everyone else is taken, right? That's the old like, yeah, little, yeah. little meme that uh, we can put up there. I love that, yeah, for sure. She's got this serious little widow's peak here in the front that even if like the strength in the line is the same when I bring it down, it's gonna split. <laughs> you used to have one? <laughs> and now what now I wanna do- on shoulders. So, be <laughs> because the widow's peak is gonna split the hair there, I'm deciding that I gotta break up these heavy areas so that it at least like visually mimics the kind of texture that the widow's peak is gonna create. So uh, close your eyes again. I'm just combing this down and like holding it in place a little bit. You could use it with the spine of your comb if you wanted, I think is another great way to do it. And then I'm gonna work in at a slight diagonal there to break that weight up so that it's matching the texture of the widow's peak. And we will put a little product in, but I also want to anticipate that she might not put product in. And one thing that I always want from my models at hair shows, at least whenever possible, depending on what you know they want me to do, is I want the models to actually love their hair when it's done. And you know maybe she can tell us something about it, but models at hair shows don't always love it when it's done. You know, I, I think um, it's great that it's artistic, but I still want to treat the models like they're a client and I want them to love it and I think they wear it better, and you can feel it coming across that it's better when they actually like the style when it's done. So now you can see we've broken that up a lot more, and it's gonna at least like play in the same way as uh, that cowlick is. And I'm just like looking over these pieces here in the front too. I like that it's soft, but I think maybe we can just take a little bit of this stuff down right through there, and then maybe just round this um, edge up a teeny bit there too. But do you ever do around the front what you did in the back? Like kind of get on in there and undercut some of the stuff in the front? Uh, I do, if the client's uh, personality and willingness to come in for refinement allows for that because it can be a difficult grow out to cut something short around the front. And if they, you know, don't have the, the style to embrace that and to really like go with it, it, they can get stressed out about it. On longer hair, I do a thing I call a ponytail layer, but I just, I put the hair into a ponytail and I always check what is gonna fall out of a ponytail for them. And I often will have the corners, like these little uh, sideburns fall out, but I always ask a client, do you like to pull from the sideburns before I cut those? Because we know that the front hairline, the sideburns, these are weaker areas and they can be a difficult time growing out. And usually they do say yes, but I do think it's a great uh, thing to ask first to make sure before just jumping in and cutting it out. You gotta remember that, you know, we are artists and all of that, but at the same time, we are in the service industry and these are people. And I think a lot of time we can forget that. We're the only art where the art gets up and goes, oh, I don't like it. Maybe, right. maybe a tattooer, a little or, bit more permanent. And, yeah, okay, yeah, tattooer. Oh, or gets up and says, I do like it and you build a lifelong relationship with them. That's I've true. Some clients going on 30 years now. Oh yeah, yeah, I've had, my longest client is a, it's a girl named Jane Tang that was a client of mine when I was in hair school and she still sees me now, you know, and her haircut price has gone from $10 to, to, to $200 and she's still stuck with me the entire time, which I think is really awesome. Yeah, it's interesting because people ask me all the time, oh, you still do clients, you still do clients. And I say, I, I'll never give it up. I'll, I'll go kicking and screaming. Now, again, at this point, I don't want to do 50 a week. Yeah, you don't want to have to book 10 haircuts a yeah, day. I'm, I'm, I, I still love it. I just did eight clients yesterday before leaving for the airport. Oh, you did? Wow. Yeah, it was my, my favorite day uh, of the month. So you do, you're doing it once a month? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. That's awesome. Where are you taking clients these days? I'm going to start interviewing in, in, you now. In New York City, there's a, a private studio that I use. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I'm still three days uh, a week behind the chair, probably 
eight to ten haircuts in those three days, pushing in as many as I as I can. And are you doing color services as well? I'm doing color in the salon. I don't take new color clients right now because if I do, I can't take new haircuts. It fills up too much space in my right, books. Right. And I always want everything's be, such a process now with color, right? Oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. It's like you know, and I'm the I'm the king of the partial. Like you come in and you want a full, I will talk you into a partial real quick. I will do okay. I'll do three highlights. I'll do a toner. We'll we'll do a base melt and a toner. And that's Economy what you're of Yes, yes. So, but I still do color for my, my regulars, but um, I don't take any new uh, color clients because I'm wanting to take new haircut clients still. And I, I never want to say that my books are closed because people are always rotating out. You know, it's like, you know, even the, the most loyal clients, who knows, maybe they move, maybe they just decide to try something new with somebody one day. And I just want to have the space to do new things. I think also for the content for me, if, if you have the same clients for a long time, I mean, I'm always trying to offer them new styles and new things that they can do, but you end up maybe doing a trim, so doing the same haircut. All the content that people see from you on Instagram and TikTok and different places, are those your actual clients or do you have like model day where you just recruit people for that? I, uh, probably 90% of it that you see is my are my actual clients. But nowadays that I'm doing so much more education that we're planning out collections and planning out lessons, that I wanna practice or I wanna create images for, some of them are model days that we bring in. But you'll you'll notice the difference. I'll say like my client or my model, but I'd say majority of the time they are actual clients when they come in. And I'm just grabbing whoever's in the salon and saying, grab a video of this for me, get a video. I, I do get pretty particular and I kind of move them around to where I want it. And now I've actually started working with um, a stand as well. I've got a great uh, phone stand that can get really high and get shots over my shoulders. But in the beginning, you know, 100% of it, was clients, and it's only very recently have we started uh, scheduling in some actual model days. And w w what's the conversation with them? Because uh, I think, again, a lot of people would be like, oh, I don't know if my clients would like that. I mean, I, I beg to differ, but what, what's your experience? Most of the time I would say that clients love it, and especially because they know that I'm creating content all the time and they're all following and everything as well, they are expecting me to do it. Yeah. And sometimes when I don't, yeah. Like when I don't do it is when they're like, oh, you he don't doesn't like me anymore. You don't want a video? Yeah. And I'm like, well, you didn't do it. You didn't. Look at you. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> but really, a, a lot of time, if I it's, if I don't have the time in the moment, I don't get it. Or if I feel like it's a thing that I've, I've shown many times. Like right. that. that's another reason why I've started working in some models is to get more variety because what's actually popular and what people are asking for is often the same. Yeah. You know, I might have three people in a row come in and show me a, you know, a picture of something that Chris Jones did, you know, a little Chris Jones bob or, you know, something that Dom Dom did or something like that. Uh, and luckily now I have people, it's cool to have people bringing in things that, that you actually did using your pictures as inspiration. It's sort of a very um, satisfying moment. It totally is. But it, it ends up being a lot of the same stuff. So if you want to get creative or you want to try new things, I think it's a great thing to schedule some models. And there's there's no you know no shame in that online. All right, I think so we're getting to a good place to here. Your, uh, chunkers. Yeah, my chunkers. My chunkers. Even though they don't take chunks out, <laughs> why are you calling them that? But yeah, I just uh, switched back to just dust over a, a little bit of lines I saw there. But I'm honestly feeling pretty good about it now. Your face uh, straight forward. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like exactly what you wanted to accomplish. A nice strong shape <clears throat> with a loose exterior. Yeah, I'm feeling great about that. So, you know, this is also a question. How do you know when you're done? Like, do you step away, especially at a show, because, you know, you have some time. You can step away and say, I'll come back tomorrow. But, you know, when you're doing this type of work, how do, how do you know when you're done? Well, um, that's that's a hard question. I, I often feel like I can, I can cut the same haircut all day. I can't even hang out with the people whose hair I cut. Like, if I'm, like, with a friend and I cut their hair that day, I'm staring at their hair. I'll be at dinner and be like, this is one piece that yeah. I want to adjust there. So, I mean, sometimes you just need to, to let it go and walk away. Yeah. I will have one more day to look at it tomorrow. It's gonna have more color that goes on. Um, so, probably what I'll do now is I'm gonna add a little texture product to see how this is feeling and looking. I'll consult with Kylie one more time because it really is a shape that I'm making for uh, the inspiration for color that she has that she wants to do on, on this model. So, well, we'll let's see, see the product and then, and then we'll wrap it up. I think you had a, a great session. Thank you so much for sharing. Last product that, that I love, this is Dust Up from uh, Goldwell. One of my favorite things is a hair powder. And you're just gonna, you know, you're just gonna salt, salt her up a little bit there. I think it's such a cool thing. It creates a really great texture. It's very matte. 
but gives you a lot of movement. It really brings out all of that texture that you put in. You can see that nice round shape through the inside. I, like and I can yeah. even put a little on my fingers here. We'll just put a little on my hand. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little on my pinky nail and we're gonna give <laughs> Just kidding. Terrible. Those days are over. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the 80s anymore. And that way we can sort of more specifically get a little texture in these edges, you know? So I think it's really what kind of makes it fun, makes it a little bit punk, makes it a little bit rock and roll. It's an urban angel. Ooh, I like that too. I'm just stealing all of these little phrases. All right, again, it's a, it's a there's a mentor of ours you might know named Stacy Broughton. Oh, one of my was, favorite yeah. people ever. He, he used to do it something similar. That the edges were even longer, but I, it was rounded convex layers on the inside with this this connection on the edges. I, honest, I honestly urban think angel. that maybe that's where I am getting it from from yeah. my from myhairdressers.com back yeah. in the day. There may have been a video on there. Yeah. But I was just talking about Stacy with someone else here that um, I believe they color for Sassoon, and I was saying that I can literally recognize their hands. Oh, I'm yeah. like, oh my, oh that's Stacy. Yeah, oh yes, yes. Hands. he's like, she's here right now. But yeah, I love, that's like that's another thing that I would really think would be great for young hairdressers. If I had any advice for them, it's like look at the artists that were before us. Like, Everybody can recognize these hands because they look like baseball gloves. <laughs> Those little, um, I think about Sam Bias, and I was like, oh, you can re recognize Sam's like little Vienna sausage fingers that he has. You know? They stand out. You know it's his. But yeah, I'm feeling great about this shape. So I'll just bring Kylie over when we're done and. She'll let me know if she wants to great. Change. Aaron, you look fantastic. Yeah. Uh, have a great time at the show, and uh, be sure you take care of all those models that yeah, need your, yeah, yeah. Need your advice. Thank yeah. you, Jacob, for sharing with us and letting us get behind the scenes.